I have a hypothesis that says that now is the worst time ever to be independent. Welcome to the Disruptance Podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric Forney and Michael Bounds. Every week on the show, we aim to disrupt the way real estate agents and entrepreneurs think about their business and about life by disrupting the way they think. And on episode 45 and 46, Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the lies you've been told in real estate. And uh, we've had a lot of people ask about furthering that concept of lies that we've been told in real estate. And so uh, today I want to talk about more lies you've probably been told as a real estate agent. And the first lie... I want to talk about is the lie that you have to do open houses. Um, it just, I guess, um, I'm not a huge open house guy, but, um, this is the way I use open houses. I think open houses, it's, it's like a, when I'm trying to sell a client's house, there's, there's three objectives. And I tell this to my clients, I said, there's three objectives for me to host an open house. It's one to look like I'm doing something. Number one, first and foremost, it's because you think that open houses are effective. So I'll do them when you if you want me to do them. The second reason why I'll do them is because typically people come in and they if this is a four hundred thousand dollar house, they may be qualified for two hundred. I'm getting name, address, phone number, and I'll take them and help them buy a house somewhere else. And the third objective is to sell your house. And I literally will tell my clients that. Um, How does that go over? It, I, it actually goes over well because I'm okay. setting expectations. Yeah. So the next thing that I do is I tell them it's a numbers game. If I get 10 people in your house, the statistics say that I should get an offer. So if I put your house on the market and I'm struggling with getting people in your house, I will then host open houses in order to get those numbers up. Um, so I just want to set the expectation that the likelihood that I'm going to sell your, your house because of an open house is relatively low. Yeah. Right. But I'm going to do it in order to expose the property. Yep. Am I, am I wrong in that thought process? Uh, No, no. I mean, you've set the expectation, right? Is that it's mathematics at the end of the day. I like what, what I think people have to understand is, is that I, I, Open houses are neither underrated nor overrated. Right. They they unfortunately are on um, both sides of the equation here. Right. So they are overrated based on return on time for the agent who has a a better mathematical way to generate income for the same amount of time invested. And let me let me unpack that a little bit because that was confusing. So. If the average open house is two hours, let's say, right. um, you're going to have drive time there, drive time back. You've got time to put out signs, time to take down your signs. You have time to set up um, and time to tear down. Um, so let's say at minimum, you're probably looking at a total invested time from three to five hours, right. depending on how you choose to structure the grandeur of an open house. Um you then have to analyze it as what's the best return on your time uh, for three to five hours every single week of, of from a working careers perspective. Is there something that could be done more effectively yeah. than to your point, the conversion rate of what ends up being about 1%, 1% of consumers buy homes at open houses, which means if my intent is to sell the property, there are a lot of things I could do that are a lot more effective, like stand outside and twirl the cash for gold sign would probably be a better use of my time for five hours than thinking I'll sell a property at that open house. Right. Now, if you're in a market where the numbers are different, then the numbers are different. Do your own math. However, um, if you're a brand new agent and you need to have cadavers to train on, I agree. Open houses are a great solution all day long. And it's just, it's like we've all this, all of them work and none of them work. So like if you're a new agent, you're trying to gather names, you're trying to fill your database. And so it's a cheap, effective way to be able to fill your database without spending any money. Yeah. So in that regard, it's worth it. Absolutely. On the come up, it absolutely makes sense to do. <laughs> For me, well, I, you know, we track every we track yeah. everything. Eighty three open houses, uh, one year, uh, four closings. Okay, so there's a couple different things we look at. That goes well. One, you're you, like the the math is not great at that, right? Eighty three invested right. time weekends for four closings. So the breakdown then is: is do you have a terrible personality? 
<laughs> and therefore you can't convert on a right. weekend. That was probably my, that was probably my uh, culprit. And then, uh, or, oh, or two <laughs> is the market for open houses, not, um, not ideal based on your specific location, because there are some locations like that, that might get one to five visitors. And then there are some different metropolitan markets that probably get 50 plus people through an open house on TV. They get a lot Yeah, here in the Midwest. Not so much. That's the thing. Like, so for three to four and a half hours to me, an open house, I'm trying to, I'm trying to capture information. So to have conversations with people. So in three to four hours a week, do I have more conversations during that open That's house right. than I can either make a phone call, yeah. knocking on doors at an apartment, buying cups of coffee at a coffee shop, so that's what I, that's how I look at it. I look at it as okay. What are the other activities that I can that I can do and that can produce income? Open houses are great. I do them. Like I said, I'm trying to demonstrate to my seller if the house has been on the market and we're not over. We you know if I want to get people in the house, I'll do them. Would you do them right now? This is where the challenge to me lies. Is in today's market, would, does it make any sense to do one? If you have a troubled if you have a troubled listing, like if you have a listing that you just got to get, a, yeah. you want to get 10 people in, um, I, 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 I think in this market, your, I don't think you really need I it. I think it's for your first point to show the seller that you're doing something. That's my opinion from a non-realtor perspective. So what I'll do is I'll list the house, like we'll have a house go live on a Thursday and then we'll have an open house on a Sunday. And then you say you can't respond to yeah. any we're not responding to any offers until after that. And then you can use it as a point of leverage. Yeah. So that's the difference that I want to touch on though, is, is that from an agent perspective, the thing to keep in mind is you have to look at your time in a couple of different ways. You have to look at it as leisure or leverage Yeah. Right? is what will you be levering with your time that you would have invested into an open house that will generate you a greater return on time or what leisure based activity are you doing that is worth the amount of time and the income that you're foregoing um, that you could have been doing on on conducting an open house. And that's where each person has to make that decision based on what their own time is worth from a market based perspective. Great. So we had. Uh, why don't you guys yeah. take that? You take the question. You take the, yeah, the that, overrated, that, underrated. Because uh, what I was going to say is like with open houses, that's one way to like generate leads, which is like definitely fair. Did you during your 83 open houses, did you guys end up having any leads come from it? Yeah, that was actually the four, right? Because we so we track where it's the initial point of contact oh, is where right, do they wow. the drive from, and so the the four now it now but they three, didn't buy that house at buy, the open correct, house. They, correct, you got the name correct. and number, and you sold. Them I've a only house ever later. in my career, I've only ever sold one house from I've an open house. I've done it twice. Okay. So that's the point that I'll try to tell people is like, look, I've been doing this 20 years and I've sold one yeah. time it happened and one time it fell apart. So I actually have one. <laughs> yep. So like I want people to understand that the open houses do work, but the likelihood if I'm the seller, the likelihood of me selling this house from this activity is really low. But the likelihood of me to sell a, a house to another house from that activity goes up. Absolutely. Although now that I say that we sold a house last week, oddly enough, we had 104 showings in three days wow. and the buyer came through on an open house, wow. um, cash buyer too. So interesting, but, um, the, it's mathematically the odds right. are incredibly low. So like, so open houses definitely are a, for a new person, a good way to generate leads. Do it. And Do it. Yeah. I think, that would be good. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. And you can post about it on social Your time media value like is low. Yeah. You're not, you don't, you're broke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, hey, look, I'm so go. This. And yeah. you need to learn how to talk to people. Whoa. Honestly, you need to learn how, what the market looks like. You need to learn the questions that people ask. It is a cadaver. It is the, it is the lab for you as a surgeon to learn how to cut people open and, and try to figure out what is in here yep. and how do I make sense of this? Yep. It is, it is a training ground with, with live people. And I don't think, I think when people talk about open houses, I don't think they ever draw that distinction. I don't, I don't, no. I've never had this conversation where you just talk about open houses in general and we all just go into either you don't do them or you, or you do. And I think that that's a great distinction. Like it really depends on where you are in your career. Like me, I delegate it. Like, Hey, if I have a house and I feel like it needs an open house, delegate it off to an agent that is, you know, 
that does that. There's Absolutely. always, yeah. Um, but what would you say to people that, because I remember 2013 to 2015, I remember Zillow leads. I know I'm saying the Z word here, but, <laughs> but like, I feel like that was a very applicable way to just shortcut the system and buy leads. And if you were good on the phone, you could convert them. I've heard that the leads have become more like, I'm just looking for a rental or like they're not as good as they once were. But I do like feel like it was a, a shortcut to success. You mm-hmm. buying online leads, You Mike? buying leads? Oh, dude, I, 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 don't, I don't, I'm buying it. Like, I don't understand like where the controversy is. I really don't. <laughs> like, it's not, I mean, if you don't, if you're not digital, if you're not learning how to convert digital leads, um, just get out of real estate. I mean, because I'll be honest with you, that's what we've been talking about. Like, you have to scale your business, and buying leads is a way that you can scale your business just by um, um, just by like the sheer amount of money. And you said Zillow, but I'm yeah. being more like generic. For the record, you don't you don't I don't, Zillow I, don't leads, use, yeah. I don't use yeah, I don't use Zillow. You never use Zillow. I you've... don't use Zillow. The uh, the thing with Zillow, and I so I can't really speak to it, but it's really expensive. Yeah, it so got like, really, it got really expensive. It got really, originally it's though, still very expensive. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. feel, I feel like though there was a time where you could buy caramel leads or something for like compared to now, nothing. Yeah, there, how much is Zillow leads now? Like hundred, two hundred dollars. Yeah, that w- we actually sadly, um, I I shed a lot of tears, but recently went through our numbers because. Um, it's not a giant secret that we have been, uh, very adept and successful at converting Zillow yeah. leads into closings, but, um, and, and we're one of the few that turn a profit on them. Um, although I will say that number is continuing to dwindle over and over and over. Um, and it is interesting because I see every week, um, uh, there are some there are some incredibly subpar business uh, operators in our market that that uh, waste money aimlessly at at Zillow leads, and I see uh, every week that number declining over and over and over from a results perspective, and from the amount of market share from a Zillow spend standpoint, um, I see people spending less and less money on on online leads and the biggest contributor why is because the margins are razor thin if you don't track what your return on investment is it's about 150 140 to 175 dollars a piece when that's you crazy. look at the dynamic that's right and when you look at the <laughs> dynamic of conversion you know some of the best the kind of that like benchmark of conversion is sometimes between two and three percent yeah. Which means that for for every one hundred and forty five, one hundred and fifty dollar lead, you have uh, another fifth forty nine. Yeah. That are garbage. So yeah. 40 not and they're not garbage, but they're not being converted. They're not being converted. So forty nine of of your one hundred and fifty dollar investments are are not panning out from a conversion standpoint from a national average. Yeah. And so then you look at it and go, well, how do if I wanted to get a better ROI, how do I increase my conversion rate? Well, there's not too many options. You've got improve your skills. Yep. That takes time and that takes work. That means that your money is front running yep. your skills development. Right. You better have um a, a you can d- run out of money. That's right. You better have a deep <laughs> set of, of pockets or really be yeah. adept at, at increasing your your skills. Um, which means you also better have great training. Yeah. And so somebody has to train you how to improve your conversion rate uh, at an aggressive pace. Um, that's, that's the problem. That's what we've been. That's, that's what problem. we've been great at. It's not that the the it's not whether or not to do the uh, online leads. It's to understand that you suck at them and you need to <laughs> figure right. out how to convert them. Because if you don't figure out how to convert them, you're going to be out of business. Eventually, it's going to drain all of your profitability at a certain yeah. point, for sure. And so that's where that's where what you'll see is like for our case, we're profitable because we have a higher rate of conversion, and because you know we've had a, I mean, I mean we've had a litany of agents taking Zillow leads over the you know six years that I've bought the, the, them, and all of them 
uh, for the most part, were able to improve their conversion rate to a point of making it a worthwhile investment. The equalizer will be this current market uh, that we're in right now, right. where the return those that had some slight margin of profitability are are going to lose more and more market share and lose more and more money every coming month because what do you get with online leads? You get buyers. Yeah. What do we not need more of right now? Buyers. Buyers. Yeah. There is a massive surplus of those that are shoppers and those that are committed buyers. And there's yeah. a massive distinction between the two. And right now when it costs $150 for a shopper, yeah. the margins significantly bucks. dwindle compared to what it used to look like when you had actual buyers, yeah. which means there's a whole new set of skills that those that were paying to play have abandoned for the last five years, which is how to learn how to get listings. Yeah. And when you're now trying to figure out how to develop the skill set to get listings, after abandoning that for the last five to ten years, yeah. you're already behind. You're already behind. Yeah, you, 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 we that's the listing agents are really happy right now. Absolutely. <laughs> They're doing Absolutely. okay. Because guess what? All all of us buyer agents, all of us work for them. Yes, that's right. That's we the thing to keep in mind. Work for them. Yeah. And so like you want to be able to shift to where so that's why I, I I do a lot of Facebook and I do a lot of Google. And so leads on, like this is the thing. Like I'm like leads have gotten way cuz I've been doing that for a long time. Did you they, used to generate like hundreds. I used to generate hun like insane amount of leads with like 100 bucks. Yeah. 500 yeah. bucks. So it's not like that now. We I'm spending for sellers. I'm spending about last I looked last month when I cuz I do, I like tripled my seller. I we were buying buyer leads and we're buying seller leads and I tripled my seller leads and I was spending $6 a lead. Yeah. So I was like I'm gonna triple it. Which is <laughs> $6 which, a lead. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean um with you know you leveraging that and then it's a numbers game. Um I have a sales agent, they call, set appointments, and then it's just a numbers game. So with Zillow, you might have a better conversion, but I'm getting, I get way more leads that I'm able to have more conversations through. Like if you're coming in, like, I don't know how you can come in as a new agent and pay $150 a lead. You can't. There's just you no can't. way. If I mean, I just was to a new give agent, you, there's no way. Uh, I mean, just to be the old man on the rocker, I mean, I paid $350 a month. Yeah. When I started buying Zillow leads and that was my car payment at the time. And I remember freaking out because it was like, man, I can't take on an extra car payment right now. And then, and then I broke even six months. I, I, I probably actually lost money, but let's say I broke even cause my gross was about $1,800. Yeah. What I spent on the leads was around two grand. And, and so I almost broke even and then I upped upped it to twelve hundred a month. The after that, mm -hmm. and after you broke even, and I was freaking out. After I broke even, I bumped it to twelve hundred a month. But I was freaking out because that's what my mortgage was yeah. at the time. Yeah, and so it's like, well, I definitely can't take on a second mortgage payment. Well, twelve hundred dollars gets you almost nothing, nothing right now, and mathematically, yeah. it gets you. Um, you know, fewer yeah. than 10 leads 10 at the leads. going rate of, of what they are currently. Yeah. The, so the difference, the deciding factor is on whether you're doing online leads or not is, um, do you have someone who's teaching you the skill set that is required to actually convert them at a profitable rate? And are you committed to getting better every single day from a skill set perspective so that you can transition to becoming a listing agent? So that you can actually be the employer uh, and controlling uh, and control your time uh, to where you're no longer reliant on a third party company to generate online leads for you. What he said. And so and then your signs, now your signs are generating yeah. leads because now your listings, you have signs all the time and people are calling you and getting online from that perspective. You said earlier that your that buyer's agents are like that they're working for listing agents. So I'm curious, like when when would it make sense then to hire a buyer's agent to field those Zillow calls or those Facebook leads? Would it make sense to hire one of those agents like as soon as you can so that you're not, so then you can have access to more conversations? No, 
<laughs> no. <laughs> um, and, the, and the reason why is because that's a shortcut and shortcuts never work. They, you, you might think they work in the moment and the reality is the shortcut never works, right? It's like um, if, if you're a Navy SEAL and you take a shortcut, you're dead. There's a high probability you're dead. Or somebody's right? dead. Someone's getting killed when you take a shortcut. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, um, business and life works the exact same way. Is There are no free lunches, as boomer as I sound with that. And the reality is, is going out and hiring. Going. That's right. Going out and hiring a buyer's agent because you don't want to do the work or you don't um, have the bandwidth to show several houses at one time because of the demand um, by your consumers has you showing a bunch of houses at one time will eventually be a disaster and it, it will become a disaster either because you offer no value and eventually that agent will leave yeah. or because your business will be incredibly chaotic. It actually causes more work. It does. It and literally will cause you to do more work. The other option is, is that you'll actually find that despite the fact that maybe you're converting at a higher rate, you're not actually capturing and retaining any more profit. Yeah. And that's because you haven't analyzed what the actual operating costs of the, your business are in order to figure out where's the break even and profit line with having um, a buyer's agent. Because most people undervalue um, or underprice the cost of providing the services that are operating in their business in order to have someone else who's actually productive and profitable in their organization, like a buyer's agent. Right. That is it, a buyer's agent costs you money whether you choose to do the accounting or not. Right. Ignoring your bank account and your PL doesn't mean that it didn't cost money. That's what most real estate agents do, however. So I want to amend my my answer. It's not no, it's it depends. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so my depends is if everything has been set right, like if you have all the infrastructure and everything in place and you've done everything that's in like the MREA book just states that you need to add leverage. If you have leverage, if everything is humming, then yeah, you need to hire a buyer's agent. But most people do what I did was I was a buyer's, I was in a buyer's agent in that sense. I was an agent, I was a buyer's agent. I was exhausted. So I don't, Hey, come over here. I'm gonna give you these leads. And then I'm going to, you know, then we can work together as a team. That's the wrong way to do it because you need, like I said earlier, you need support. What happens is if you do not build the support within your in, within your organization early, guess who becomes the support? Yeah. yeah and so now you work twice as hard because right. now you're an admin yeah. <laughs> yep. for you and someone else. That's right. And you're training them. And guess what? You still got to sell houses and you still got to do all the work. Yeah. So until you have the re, the that support in place do not even think about hiring a buyer's agent yeah if you have no admin you are the admin that's how it works and and the reality is is people don't follow the system and model in order to do that and then they don't document the system and the model in order to have someone else be able to follow it and so it always goes you the salesperson step two someone to document the systems, systems, the processes, and the models. Yep. Chick-fil-A has a successful franchise model because they are able to document the franchise model for what the processes look like in order to be successful every time. And duplicate it. They don't hire a bunch of high school kids who say, my pleasure, and think that's going to be a scalable business model. Mm -hmm. That's the failure that most real estate agents make. And the reason why the profitability doesn't actually increase when you when you hire additional people, if it's not actually a scalable process, I tell people like I literally just had this conversation in my driveway yesterday because I'm working from home <laughs> um, is when you come and I, this isn't a Keller Williams podcast. But when I work for Keller, we were at Keller Williams. When you come to Keller Williams, what you're paying for is a franchise. Yeah. So you're paying for the systems and the models. I went if I want to go buy a Chick-fil-A franchise. Chick-fil-A teaches me where to, you know, where to buy the food. They build, help, they do all those things. And then I follow that model. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when we go to like a discount brokerage, you're just, you're not paying for the systems and models and then you don't have it. Absolutely. So then you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm paying, you know, I might get this transaction fee or whatever, but they're not giving you the systems and models in order to grow your business. Mike, I, I'm, I'm. I know the code of ethics. Uh, I won't pretend. 
I won't pretend that uh, I may not slip up and say something. So um, I'll I'll ask for forgiveness if I if I um, we'll put like a make caution. if I make a uh, if I make a statement that is not uh, becoming of the uh, code of ethics. But you know, we started tracking offers that we're receiving right now. The other day, we had 50, 54 offers on a listing. Um, and I've, I have one, uh, that we started adding to a spreadsheet yesterday that has 16 offers on it. Um, and, and we started adding a tab, um, for what company from a franchise perspective or from an independent perspective, someone is with, yeah. not because it at all factors into how a decision is made, right. but because I actually want to track right. how critical is it mission critical right now? In the way that the competitive landscape of where things are, how mission critical is it to be aligned with a company like a Keller Williams where there's a documented system and model and group think towards growth? Culture. And culture versus, <laughs> absolutely, deep. when the when the culture of the company is group think towards growth yep. versus being on an island of independent fractured real estate industry, what are the results looking like? Yeah. Because because I have a hypothesis that says that now is the worst time ever to be independent. And, and that's because I, the market is changing at a rapid rate that we've never seen before, which means if you're on an island on your own, you don't have the benefit of getting the system in a model that's being adapted regularly through data and through that growth related group think. And when so you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. I was at a small independent and I, I just didn't know, like you don't know. And until you get around people that can do things on a big level, then you're like, Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Well, well, I'm going to report <laughs> back the, the, the findings because it's in, because what I really noticed is the way offers are written. There, there are those that write in like there, there is a pattern, I believe, of how offers are written from um, a franchise perspective and from a non-franchise perspective. Right. And I, I have a hypothesis that says now is the worst time ever to not be part of a group. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think there, there, there can be some sloppiness. There's not the training there. There's not, you know, from that perspective, I, I'm an individual independent brokerage. I, you don't really focus on the training and the, and the day to day. But if, to, it's the echo chamber concept, right? Yeah. If you, if you, if your echo chamber says that I never advise a buyer or a seller to do this. X, yeah. That might have been the right echo chamber for 2016. Yeah. But we're no longer in that echo chamber anymore. Yeah. Well, we're not in that world that, anymore, that's right. but they're still in that echo that's chamber. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's, absolutely. <laughs> so what it allows you to do, we have a bigger, you know, a bigger KW uh, a network to yeah. draw from. So I'm, yeah, I'm totally... So then how much would you say, so if, if it's not necessarily the... Uh, if it, your opinion is like, I don't think you should be in a, at an independent brokerage because of the echo chamber or have your own. I think that's one of many reasons. I, um, I think the echo chamber and, is exclusive. Um, would you, how important then would you say culture is to a real estate team or a brokerage? Well, I think you have to understand first what, what culture is, right? I mean, cu culture... Um, and I say that because cult culture has been bastardized, right? Like we go, um, yeah. we go, Mike, on appointments where um, we compete against culture. And, you know, you, you, you talk to an agent who's like, well, I went and met with XYZ company and ABC company. And, okay, great. What, and um, what were the things that uh, they culture. told you that you would get by joining XYZ company? Uh, we get training and culture. Great. What How do they define that, right? As what does that mean to you? What does that mean to ABC company? So the reality is when, when culture became a sales pitch, it became bastardized. And so what culture actually is, is, is how you think, how you act, how you interact, the standards and values of operating within an organization, right? Right. If we, we, to understand culture, we look historically at the concepts of culture. What's the culture of the Christian church? What's the culture of, of ancient Egyptians? What's the culture of, um, you know, any civilized society 
organization. The, there is a yeah. law of spoken and unspoken um, expectations of how we think, act, and interact that then get cemented by stories and history, symbols, language. Um, culture is an incredibly deep topic when you actually dive down this rabbit hole and yet it's been, it's been watered down into a sales pitch. Right. Okay. So does culture matter? Um, well, if you're on an Island by yourself, guess what the culture is, whatever you make it. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, what we know is that civil discourse and, yeah. and a differing of opinions and a differing of perspectives creates eventually um, an idea meritocracy the best idea wins growth growth absolutely it's how you innovate that, yeah i just distilled what you just said yes thank you <laughs> so right now right now if if you don't think culture matters it means that you're, you're not innovating you're, you're stagnant. stagnant that's right yeah it, yeah and that's, if that's important to you i mean the thing is some people that's just they don't want growth it, so it I'm is just that saying, even possible though like, I know it's possible that someone doesn't want growth, the, by the way. I'm talking to a lot of these agents. I know that. <laughs> I know that. But what I mean by that is really is that there actually is no just an illusion. Yes, backwards. thank you. Yeah, like there's no such thing. You're like, actually you're falling growing. down the mountain thinking the mountain is getting taller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I think culture is important. Um, I've been to four different brokerages. And the one that I finally kind of figured it out was at KW. And... Um, I was one of those guys throwing rocks and uh, uh, KW, but now that I'm here, I, I, I drink it. it I mean, look at your shirt. Even Mike, says, think big, aim high, act bold, right? Like, so here's this, here's this language. Here's the symbols. Yeah. Here's the, how to think, how to act, how to interact concept coming into play, even then with your apparel, right? So now you're reemphasizing the cultural expectation. I'm seeing that. I know it's God. Uh, God, family, then business. Yeah. That's the vision. Yeah. So that appeals to me. So then, therefore, I go to that that place that appeals to me. If God, family, then business business wasn't important to me, then I'll go to my competitor. Go to yeah. the competitor. So that's why it's really important. And then it's my job. I aspire to that. Yeah. And then it's my job to walk in that. And sometimes I fall. Sometimes I slip. But that from a culture perspective, as long as the culture is, we're all aspiring. We're not saying God first. We slip up. Yeah, all of, of course. Us do. Of course. Yeah. But as long as we're aspiring for that, that is important to me. Yeah. I want to go down the, the culture rabbit hole a little bit more. And I know we won't have time to do that today. But, you know, I think about, um, you know, the concept of culture comes up in parenting, right? Is, you know, Southern culture oftentimes mm -hmm. in America is going to be yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, there's more uh, what appears to be a degree of um, manners and politeness. Formality. Where does that come from? Formalness. Right? Where does that come from? Culture. culture. Someone has to ingrain the, the thinking model, the acting model for someone that says, this is how you think, this is how you act, this is how you interact social with people. Social norms. And that's right. And all social norms are, are an accepted culture yep. of a society. So what the culture of the business says is the social norm is we are top producing real yeah. estate agents and we're adopting top producing business and models. Yeah. And that's the reason why we're 16% over our competition right yeah. now is because we indoctrinate KW agents, that culture within our, within our agents and they're winning. Well, Mike, I thought, I think it's interesting where this is what kind of was the catalyst for this hypothesis. We started the year as a team um, in the actually in a worse position as a team than I was as an individual. So we'd have to go back like six years to find worse in the overall yeah. rankings right. um, than where we started as a company. Um, and now we're, we're back up within, uh, I think by the end of the month, we'll be at top, top five again. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but uh, but I, it was not a self gloss. <laughs> However, um, I say that because what I looked at then was I look at the ranking report on a regular basis. And what I saw in our, in our market is, is six of the top 15, in, in the board, where it has almost 9,000 real estate agents, six of the top 15 are Keller Williams agents. 
And we we were at one point not long ago one and in that like one fifty to two hundred range, mm-hmm. and then made changes, adapted. Yep. Um, because used, you have you have documented systems right. and models, and you can and pivot. and we have the ability to um, group, think, and discuss, and revise, and innovate if something's not working. And the culture of the company says that we openly um, discuss big ideas and ways to aim high and to act bold about taking actions that are that are innovative for the market of the moment. And so I had that network of people that I could we could have that conversation with yeah. to make the adjustment. And so you see right now a wealth divide of real estate due to culture. And that wealth divide is the haves and the have nots. Those that are adapting because of the culture they're plugged into and making changes for the market to help their clients and those that are sticking to their old ways because they have a culture of an isolated island effect yeah. where unfortunately you see culture um, definitely helping people win and punishing um, even more aggressively than, than what we've seen in the past for those that do not. I am numbers driven, okay? So I'm very numbers driven. If I look at the top ranking report, and I look at the brokerages, I don't see ABC, one, two, three. Yeah. I see boom, 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 boom. Yeah, Why brands. is that? Yeah. Why is that? It, it's it's a model. It it's really the model. is. Yeah. Like people, you're buying. This is the yeah. thing. When you come, I tell the lady, this is why I was telling the lady, this is the fatal flaw for real estate agents. This is it. You go buy a Chick-fil-A franchise. Most real estate agents, they'll go buy the Chick-fil-A franchise. And then instead of listening to Chick Fil A and them <laughs> telling you where to buy the yeah. food, where to do this, where to yeah. do that, they come in there and they tell them how. No, they I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna, business. I'm gonna serve cheeseburgers instead. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. have, yeah, I might have hot dogs at this. Yeah, Chick-fil-A. I'm gonna. So the problem is, you go in, you plug into the systems and the models, you do, you, you mimic what they're doing, and then that's it. That's it. But when you go to other brokerages or if you're independent, you don't have those systems and models and you're just making it up. Absolutely. So um, from from a time perspective, Mike, next week, I want to talk about on the show how to actually take tangible, tactical information from an implementation of culture perspective. Maybe we'll dive into understanding what it is and then how do you how do you build it or how do you create it in an organization so that it becomes your your system and your model from a growth perspective. How do you teach others how to think, act and interact in order to build the business that you want to build? 